they both false. They don't exist. Either one of them. So in case it's a question of test, I'm going to show you. Yeah, it could be either Zeus or. Okay. We all set here? Yeah. Yeah. Wake on me. That's pretty good. Nobody's snoring. <laughs> <laughs> Father, bless and help us to continue and remember these things and glory in them, Father. See your hand in history and people's lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we're in this Maccabean rebellion. Pathias starts it. <laughs> He loses it, if you will. No more! We're not going to have this idolatry. And kills someone sacrificing to an idol. The king's, uh, whatever was set, the king sent to make sure this sacrifice happened. And they started guerrilla warfare. Farm implements, that's the best we're told. And they are successful. With this, he dies soon thereafter. And the leadership of the battle, most of it goes to his son Judas, who is known as Judas Maccabee. We've got him there. And of course, the Maccabee is not his last name. Maccabee, in Hebrew, is hammer. So he called himself, he called himself Judas the Hammer. <laughs> and so did his followers, so they were called the Maccabeans. And different people who were, you know, you can understand why people were desperate and willing to fight. If I die, I die. I don't want to live under this Antiochus before. I'd rather, I'd rather die than, than live like this and, and, you know, bow down to some uh, statue of Zeus or Jupiter and, and, and slaughter pigs and eat unclean food and skip the Sabbath and uh, not circumcise my, you know, I can't practice Judaism. So they were willing to fight. Antiochus sent a small army against them, which they defeated. He sent a second, much larger army against them, which they defeated. And uh, it took 20 years of fighting. But Antioch, he, he died, and his successor said, Okay, uh, you're officially in our empire, but we're going to give you self rule. And they lived for a hundred, as a result of this 20 years of fighting. I'm going to do this quick. 20 years they fought for total. Uh, 20 years they gained freedom for about 120 years as a result of it. Self autonomy. They were able to keep their religion, their ways, and be Jews. Unfortunately, during that time, they, they did not have a lot of unity. They, they divided up into different groups that were at each other all the time. And this, this greatly weakened the Jews. But they had their freedom. And they remembered this. When Christ comes along, they want another what? They want another hammer. They want to deliver. This time, uh, the Romans will come in Pompeii. The next one to come along to rule them. Pompey was a Roman general who ruled, came in and took control of Palestine in 63 B.C. So it went from, the, from, from these Greek rulers to Roman rulers. And they, they really had hopes that God was going to deliver them with a military victory. And of course this was not Jesus' plan, this was not God's plan. But this is the history for it. Some of you, was it which one of Jesus' apostles was a zealot? Simon. Which one? Simon the Zealot. Simon the Zealot. The Zealots were a group. They wanted a revolution. And so was Barbara. They wanted a Barbara. military revolt. Barabbas was. And they were, they were a group in Israel. And that's what they were after. So, uh, and of course, because the pagans were pagans, and, they, and the Romans would bring in statues and worship them and, and other gods and were immoral, even such things, they, you know, they had the, the Greeks were famous and the Romans for the gymnasium. Well, the wrestlers in the gymnasium would wrestle naked. Imagine to an Orthodox Jew, you bring this garbage, this disgusting thing, into our city. I mean, they, they, you know, that could cause a riot in Jerusalem doing such things, but they did those kinds of things. So, just being pagans, they antagonized the Jews. 
<laughs> and then they had, you know, puppet kings that did cruel, nasty things, and you can see why there were there were periodic revolts. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip through here quickly. So the hammer, uh, Judah Maccabee, and his followers. The idea is, and this is where history is a little. We're not sure if it happened. Hanukkah comes from this. And it's the idea that when Judas finally retook Jerusalem, they cleansed the temple. They did not have enough oil for, for, for lamps to burn, but the lamps burned with, it seemed a day's less oil, eight days. We're not sure if it's true because the story of their revolt and conquest of Antiochus and his armies is in 1 Maccabees. In 1 Maccabees, there's no mention of the Hanukkah lights in the temple. It's in other places. Well, why didn't they put it there? So they don't know if that happened or not. The fact that a small group of, of Jews defeated two armies and gained their liberty is not, is, is history. It, there's no fable to that. The Hanukkah lights, we do not know. We do know this. I have the scripture for you. Let me go on here one uh, there's Pompeo conquered and the statue of him, 63. Let's see, I'm, I'm skipping this. I thought I had a picture of it. But, uh, I'm going to try to remember here. I can't do it. Oh, well, we'll come back to me. At this point, I do a little bit of review. You. This brings us up to where I started you at the beginning of class. So, if you will, what's the major things affecting the Jews during that time? Alexander the Great, his conquest, bring Greek culture, Greek language, and then, of course, those four generals of his, one of those had a descendant named Antiochus IV that tried to stomp out Judaism during this 400 year period of time. And the Jews won. And they were regarded throughout the Roman Empire as fierce warriors. If you will, the Romans did to some extent understand don't antagonize the Jews. <laughs> because they'll fight. And a lot of us will get killed putting this thing down. Because that's exactly what happened. So, let's go through, just, just quick here. Best date for the birth of Christ around 6 BC. And we know that because Herod, who tried to put Jesus to death, died in 4 BC. We talked about that. It's a little reveal. Best date for his crucifixion, 30 AD. Crucified on the Passover, the 14th of Nisan. You should remember that. Who could tell me the holiday on the 15th of Nisan that was celebrated while Jesus was in the tomb? Day of uh, what do we got? Separation, feast separation? No, feast day. Feast day? Oh. That's the day in between. Uh, next feast day? First fruits. First fruits. Unleavened bread. Okay. Now, you remember when you celebrate unleavened bread, you take unleavened bread and you do what with it? You break it and eat it. Jesus' broken body laid in the tomb on the first day of, of unleavened bread. The next, he's raised on the next feast day on the 16th, which is the feast of what? First fruits. First fruits. One of my students was doing this. Says it's a feast of fresh fruits. No, it's first fruits, not oh, fresh. Fruits. Fresh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Jesus was fresh from the fruit. grave. I don't know. You know. Yes, maybe there's something to it. So, but we actually know the dates: 14th of Nisan, 15th of Nisan, 16th of Nisan. We 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 went through how you do that. It really comes out he's you know, three 24-hour days. You can you can calculate it that day that way in the, in the tool. And we'll we and, and then raised, but we're not going to go review that right now. So he's dead, resting, garden tomb, feast of unleavened bread, 15th of Nisan, the 16th, feast of first fruits. He is raised from the dead. Okay. And as Jonah said, three days and three nights. We did mention there's two different ways to look at this. If you take a traditional Passover as Good Friday, if you will, we are thinking, then you have part of Friday, all of Saturday, and part of Sunday. And there is a Jewish expression that says three days doesn't have to be three complete days. But Jesus said three days and three nights. 
The Jewish way to look at this, and I believe it's a stronger one scripture we looked at last week, is for a Wednesday Passover feast. Okay? Wednesday Jesus is actually crucified. Tuesday night, which is the Passover begins, he's having the Last Supper. And then you come up with you come up with three full days from Wednesday to Saturday night. Three seventy two hours complete. It works. And the scriptures show that in between, there was a day of pre there were two days of preparations. One day of the preparation for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, another day, and then another day of preparation for the regular Sabbath. And it, it really fits the scriptures well. So, I'm not worried about it, but the case is there. So, some of you remember your notes from last week to look at that. Church is born, Pentecost. How many days after first fruits is Pentecost, folks? Fifty. Fifty. The Jews call it the Feast of Weeks because it's after seven weeks. The fiftieth day after seven sevens. Okay, the church is born on there. Just a little review here. Now, <laughs> important date in history. And we didn't really mention this too much. Nero's Rome burns. Now they know the date. July 18th, 64. AD. Rumor had it that Nero either started the fire or played his fiddle while Rome was burning. And Nero was upset with this. So history is very clear. This Nero claimed that these, these weird, strange cultic Christians started the fire. And he and he had Christians put to death and tortured to death. So between 64 67 AD was an imperial persecution of Christians, particularly in Rome. Many historians believe that Paul and Peter died at that time. That we cannot be sure of. But uh, that's, that's, if you will, best guess when they die. But it gives you an idea how short-lived their preaching was. The church starts in 30 AD. We think they're dead at this point. We know this. In Paul's missionary trips, he wanted to visit, he wanted to celebrate uh, Pentecost in Jerusalem at the temple. In 70 AD, there is no temple. So Paul's missionary trips had to be before 70 AD. So it's, you know, let's call it short and sweet. All right? But they, they did preach with great effect but for a short period of time. Now, about their deaths, you know, Paul writes, when he's writing to Timothy, he knows his time is short. He talks about it. In the Gospels, John 21, 18, Jesus tells Peter that he's going to die a martyr's death. So Peter understood this. Church history, and we cannot verify it, says that Peter asked not to be crucified at his Lord, that he did not deserve that honor. He says, crucify me upside down. You can actually, you know, that's the only that he was crucified upside down, lived on that cross for three days while he preached. But that, that's what we have. We can't prove those things are not in the scriptures. It's an unknown. History has, has those details to give us I somehow hope for Peter's sake they weren't true. <laughs> all right. He's in paradise. He's with God. And I didn't put all the background here, but this is really uh, a game changer at this point. And we're, we're getting close to the end here. We're actually going to end a little early tonight. 70 AD, Titus destroys Jerusalem. The uprising did not start that year. I believe, I think it's uh, 67 AD, the uprising begins, and from Caesarea, a Roman general is sent with a force to siege the city. He realizes he does not have enough troops to keep the sustain, he does not have enough food and supplies to sustain the siege. He marches his army back to Caesarea. He's killed in the meantime. There's civil war going on back in Rome, so Rome takes no action. So from 67 to 70, they're free. 
But of course, this Roman general did siege the city for a while. And Jesus told his disciples, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, flee. But when Jerusalem is surrounded, you can't flee. So when the general retreated, Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, they left. And they actually formed, according to, uh, I've seen a Fruchenbaum write about it, they formed a settlement on the other side of the Jordan River. People who, who fled from Jerusalem, believing that Jesus said, flee when you're surrounded by an army, because destruction is at hand, they did. And then, Titus came back with his father, actually, who was in charge of the time, Vespasian, I believe his name. But Vespasian left and left the, the finish of the siege to Titus. So Titus does take Jerusalem. When he does, and I, I remember a tour guide telling him, is he has this on top of Mount of Olives. And we can look over down below on Jerusalem. He says, Titus put catapults up on the Mount of Olives and catapulted boulders into the city to destroy it. They, they took the city, they burned it, they burned the temple to the ground. I think I mentioned last week, they, uh, they slaughtered people, and before this, it was a long siege, people died from starvation and disease. Josephus says that about a million people died in that siege, in, in battle. As Jesus said, he said, when the disciples praise how wonderful the temple was, Herod's temple, he said, not one stone will be left upon another. In the siege, you burn the inside of the temple, which has cedar boards in it, <coughs> covered by gold. You don't want to lose any of that precious gold, so you'll pull apart all the stones. It's like any gold melted into the stones. You scrape it away. It's the temple. There's never been a temple since then. So it's a change. Uh, I just read an article, part of an article in Christianity Today, it said that after 70 AD, the Jews would not let Jewish Christians into their synagogues. They were angry. Their attitude was, you fled. You deserted us. If you had stayed with us and fight, we might have won. So the Jewish Christians and the Jews who did not believe in Jesus, it was a major separation from 70 AD at this point. And in many ways after that, it becomes a very Gentile church. So that, and that becomes an important day. It's a real marker, one we know that happened. The other day really ends the age of the apostles. Around 98 AD, Apostle John dies. They're no longer the 12. They're all gone now. And so after that we speak of the church fathers who were disciples of these men. And they, they discipled men who took over. And from 98... Or a hundred, you know, between 98 and 100, when the apostles are all dead, we have a full canon of scripture. All the New Testament books have been written by then. We have quotes from, from them back to that period. But from that period, let's just say uh, BC, round off here, around 100, till 313. A.D., this period, the next generation of leaders, often called the church fathers, or the apostle, the apostolic fathers, meaning they, they, go, they, they date back to disciples of the apostles, uh, is, is usually called the age of persecution, or the age of the martyrs. Because ten emperors, ten emperors ordered per different types of persecution of Christians during that time. And there were, there were local persecutions going on too in, in different ways. But it would, you know, when we talk, when you hear stories about Christians being thrown to the lions, they did it. Colosseum in Rome during that period was going on. And the other thing that changed, the next generation, after 100 A.D., or B, A.D., yeah, A.D., we do not see the kind of miracles that the apostles performed. Well, or people like, uh, see, Stephen performed miracles. Philip the Evangelist performed miracles. In that age, they would preach and perform miracles. Not that there were no miracles happening at all, but it, 
it was just different. It, they were the signs and wonders were not there, but the church kept spreading. Particularly, two reasons: their bravery facing martyrdom and persecution, and Christians. There was never a Christian who went without. They took care of each other. They had an amazing love for one another, and so Christian love and their bravery to preach the gospel in the face of death caused the church, especially in the lower classes, to multiply. So it's interesting that the church would do so well without the miracles. Blood and love. <laughs> and you, you can take an empire that way. They did. That's the two things we see. Now, I mentioned 313. This is the good news and the bad news. <laughs> Let's see. There, at this point, there are two emperors in the empire. Constantine in the west, Licinius in the east. And they want to make peace. So, we want, a, we want a marriage here between, you know, get blood going here. So they arrange a marriage between Constantine's half-sister and Licinius. And that wedding is to take place in Milan, Italy. So it is a happy occasion. There's going to be a marriage. There's peace in the empire. The two emperors are agreeing to share power, not fight with one another. This won't last long. But at the time it is. And at that meeting, Constantine comes up with an idea. He says, let's allow religious freedom for all people in the empire. That a man can worship whatever god or gods he wants, the dictates of his own conscience, without any persecution. Lucinius agrees to it. It's called the Edict of Milan. But there was no edict. An edict means you make a pronouncement. There was no public pronouncement made at that time. What we have is Licinius going back to the east. He then made a proclamation. We have a record of Licinius's proclamation, not the original, whatever they agreed to. But they did agree. So there was an agreement made there. And so that's the date when no longer is Christianity persecuted, but it's also an unhappy day for this reason. A wedding took place on that date between, you know, Constantine's sister and Licinius. But from that day on, there was a second marriage that went on. Church and state. It was a bad marriage. Meaning the emperor started sticking his nose in the church's business in a huge way. And so, can you, let me just give you a contemporary example. We have, uh, we have two denominations who get an argument over theology. And Obama decides that he's going to have, uh, he's going to sponsor a conference and have them decide their differences, and he's going to umpire the conference. You would flip out in protest. Get your face. I mean, we use probably a stronger language than that. Out of our business, please. We, you know, we'd be outside with banners. Obama, leave. None of your business. You know, go back to the Beltway. <laughs> They did not. And so, you know, it, it, it started trouble, and it's always been a problem. Church and state combined together has never been good for Christianity. All right? And the, when the Protestant Reformation comes by in 1517, the Luther and, uh, come on, what's, what's his other? Uh, Calvin. What? Calvin. Calvin. They too. If your leader was a Calvinist, you were a Calvinist. If your leader was a Lutheran, you were a Lutheran. Church and state. To this day, Europe has wonderful dead church, dead state churches. With you know, even if their doctrine is right, there's not much going on in those churches. You can have dead orthodoxy. You can say all the right things and still have a dead church. And they did. So this is the beginning of church and state. Bad marriage. <laughs> oh, let's see if I have any more here. Yeah. I will put this in and we'll end with this one. Now we're going to see this bad marriage between church and state take effect. And, you know, maybe like with, you know, everyday real bad marriages, they may not be all bad. <laughs> I counsel some people like that. Oh, anyway.
items. How bad is bad? Uh, it depends. So, 325. Constantine is upset because there is a raging doctrinal battle going on between what we'll call Trinitarian uh, bishops and Christians and Arians. And it's a doctrinal issue, but there are there are riots over this thing. People are scrawling their belief on, on graffiti on the walls. The people are at arms in this. They're at each other's faces and think. The empire is supposed to be at peace. At this point, Constantine has defeated Licinius, agreed to give him, uh, uh, how to say it, you know, how to say it. Oh, when you, let, when you agree not to kill the person, you, you, what's the Amnesty. Amnesty. Yeah, yeah so you, you have your liberty, but you're no longer, I've defeated you. And then he has him put to death a few years later anyways. Along with his son, which is his sister's, or sister's son, Constantine, wonderful Christian emperor. But anyways, uh, he had his faults, let's put it that way. But he's concerned. If Christianity is the leading religion in the empire and we want peace, then we've got to come to some agreement. So he calls for the bishops from all over the empire. Now, there's different sources. Somewhere between 250 and 318 bishops arrive in, in Nicaea, it's in Turkey. It's the summer home of Constantine. He invites everybody to his summer palace. And he wants them, each is allowed to bring two secretaries. These would be men back then. Men were always secretaries in those days. The fight is on because a man named Arius, is, the history calls him a presbyter, which means he was a preacher. He was a church leader. In Alexandria, remember that great city of Alexandria? He started teaching that when the Bible says that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, that Jesus was a begotten, he was a created creature. He was created by God before we were created, but he is not God, he was created by God. Alright? This is the belief system of the Jehovah Witnesses today. It hasn't died. And they quote Arius. We're going to show you a quote from Arius. So this is what they were raging mad about. And the real problem was what we call, what is it, folks? The Trinitarian. The Trinity. The Trinity. If, you have a, if, you have a, if you have a cult group, usually they get the Trinity wrong. The, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being three persons, but one God, expressed three ways, but being always one in their will, they just, oh, that's, that's more than one God. That's what the Muslims will tell you today. Okay? And that's what the Aryans said. You're worshiping two gods. Our system's right. We believe in just one God, the Father. Okay? So this became a huge debate in the church. Now, uh, like I said, the emperor, that's like the president of the United States calling a church council to decide issues, and he runs the, he runs the debate. We would be, stay out, you know. Remember Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> okay, well, you know what I'm getting at. Church, separation of church and state, but they did. So, what do I have here in my notes? I don't have any more. I'll, I'll, I'll list them here. I'm done there. Uh, we have from that, uh, I have a second presentation. I do have a few minutes just to show you. I want to show you how they resolve this thing, and then we're, we're done here. Let's see. One more. Here we go. teaching this false doctrine. A presbyter in Alexandria who held the word became incarnate in Jesus, although pre-existing before the rest of creation was not God a very God, but was rather the first of all creatures. This fits with Greek mythology. The Greeks looked at, you know, intermediaries between God and man. 
you know, one God would beget some other kind of God, and then 